Hello and good afternoon. First, I want to extend a very warm welcome to all who are joining us here today. In my previous life, I served as a civics and government teacher, and I must say it does my heart good to see so many good citizens on today's call tuning in to see how they plan to vote in House District 33 in Jefferson and Oldham counties. To introduce myself, my name is Benjamin Geese, and I'm a policy director at Kentucky Youth Advocates. At KYA, we work every day to make Kentucky the best place in the entire United States of America to be a kid. And that takes me to why we're here today. We're here today because as you know, kids under the age of 18 can't vote. And because kids can't vote, it's up to us adults to ensure that we enact policies that will help kids to grow up into healthy, well-educated, and secure adults. Today, we are honored to engage with incumbent Representative Jason Nemus, and later on, candidate Margaret Plattner of the 33rd House District. We are excited to learn more about how each of these community leaders will serve the needs of youth, should they be reelected or elected this November, really in just about a month's time. Please remember that each candidate will be joining separately for today's question and answer session. So be sure to stick around to hear each candidate's perspective. Each candidate will be given the same questions and amount of Q&A time. Before I pass things along to KY's Executive Director, Dr. Terry Brooks, who will be leading our Q&A session with the candidates, I want to share that should any audience member have a question that is not addressed today, please feel free to email me your question directly and I will work to get those questions to the candidates. For reference, my email address is bgees, G-I-E-S, at K-Y-Youth, Y-O-U-T-H, dot org. And now, please join me in welcoming our Executive Director, my friend and colleague, Dr. Brooks of KYA, who will get things started first with Representative Jason Nemus. Hey, Ben, thanks. Representative, thanks so much for joining us today. And uh, we really appreciate, as Ben mentioned, uh, all of the constituents of that 33rd district uh, who are on this live. And we know many, many others are gonna be watching this uh, through a recording. So uh, we appreciate that level of, of civic engagement. Uh, Representative Nemus, thanks so much for joining us today. If, if memory serves me, uh, you kinda came out of nowhere and you challenged uh, a pretty well established incumbent in the primary and uh, then lo and behold, beginning in 2017, you were the uh, representative from the 33rd district. Uh, I'm always curious what motivates, uh, what inspires and what galvanizes somebody to enter this sector of public service because it's, it's a tough one and it's not a, an easy time to, to be an elected leader. So what, were the, what was the decision? What motivated you? Just give us a little insight into Jason Nemus's decision to, to become a, a state legislator. Yeah, it was uh, Jason Nemus's and Leslie Nemus's decision, my wife. <laughs> Smart we, we move. That decision together. So I grew up in the South End. My mother and father were divorced when I was two years old. Um, one was uh, in middle class. One was in poverty. And so I saw um, what it was like to live on both sides of the track, so to speak, on the weekdays when I was with my father and then on the weekdays when I was with my mother, who was a single mom and struggled. Um, and so when uh, I was married to my wife, Leslie, we have three children and uh, we've done well. Um, she's a teacher and I'm a lawyer and we've done you know well enough and so we were praying on it and we decided you know let's let's we're always looking for ways we can improve our our community and improve Kentucky and we thought getting involved in politics was the way to go. Ron Krim had been elected for some 20 years and was uh, was someone who was beloved in the community um, but we thought it would might be time for a change and uh, and so uh, we decided to run and um, didn't think really when I put my name on the ballot that I could win. Uh, running against an incumbent of 20 years who was, like I said, beloved and well-known. But I took the old, uh, you know, nose to the grindstone approach and, and went and knocked as many doors as I could and uh, got my message out and was fortunate enough um, to win in this uh, suburban area. We have Eastern Jefferson County and South Odom, which is, Terry, it's, it's, a, it's a group of people, if I could generalize, it's a group of people who want to focus on economic development. They want opportunity for everybody. And we're really against meanness. Um, and so we don't want, we don't want to, uh, being overly uh, controlled people's lives. And that's, uh, that's just, that's who I am as a person, my wife is, and, 
and I think who the people I represent are generally. I want to ask one more uh, broad question before we get into policies and kids. Uh, so you ran for the General Assembly, and now you're now you're there. Uh, what <laughs> surprised you? Uh, what do you, what have you been learning? Uh, what do you wish you would have known before you showed up there? Uh, what, what's your takeaways thus far? Well, I think the thing that's the most, the most disappointing is something I'm working on. And that is that people in the middle have a rough go of it. It's really simple to be on the right or to the, or the left because you're loved by everybody on your side and you know who you're, the people who are going to be against you are. You know, one of the things that I do is, you know, I vote the way I see it. I voted against the constitutional carry bill, for example. Well, I was attacked by the right uh, pretty viciously about that. And and when I vote with, with what Republicans, uh, you know, with my Republican brethren, I get attacked from the left. So, and that's not just me, that's people in the middle who are moderates, who take ish, each issue as they come. It's really, um, it, it can get really nasty in the middle and from both sides taking shots. And so what I think the truth is though, is I think the majority of Kentuckians, I know the majority of my, my constituents, but I think the majority of Kentuckians are probably in the middle, maybe 40% in the middle, and if we could speak up more, the people right there in the 40%, we could speak up more and support one another, whether they're Republicans, independents, or Democrats, then I think we would not only progress Kentucky, but we would attract more of those kinds of people to office. Um, we've got a lot of good friends on the, on the left and a lot of good friends on the right who do what they think is right. Um, but I think we need more people, more moderates in the middle. I mean, I, maybe that's easy for a suburban guy to say, but I think that's where most, re, most um, issues can be resolved uh, most effectively. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Well, you know, uh, KYA, and so you know that our vision, as Ben mentioned, is what I would consider simple and profound, that we want Kentucky to be the best place in America to be young. Uh, we also uh, are simply not smart enough to figure out how kids grow up in silos. So we think that economics affect health and health affects education and education affects safety issues. So we look at kids in an integrated way. Uh, my hypothesis, however, is always that we have to begin with economic well-being. I mean, you mentioned that autobiographically. Uh, so when we look at that, uh, we know that, uh, that over 250,000 kids in Kentucky right. live in poverty. Uh, we know that the numbers from far eastern Kentucky really parallel urban areas. There's not this big two-state divide when it comes to childhood poverty. Uh, you're a guy that talks a lot about revenue and economic development, and you also tie it to uh, family economics, uh, your support, for instance, of the, the paid family leave provision recently. So take a few minutes. I, I, I want you to have plenty of time to kind of riff on it, but talk a little bit how you see economic well-being specifically how we combat childhood poverty uh, and what are some things that we could hope for and look for from Frankfurt to uh, begin moving the needle on that issue? Yeah, Terry, this is kind of the global issue. This is what it's all about and why I got involved in politics in the first place, because it's about family structure, all families, whether it's a single mom like my mother, whether it's a mother and father, a mother, a mother, father, father, grandparents raising kids, foster kids, I don't care. I want all families to be uh, supported. And the best way to do that is to have economic opportunity. We know the last year I looked, by the way, in 2018, poverty went down in Kentucky um, considerably. It's one of the one of the really bright things on, on mm -hmm. your data points that you submit right. to, the, to, the, to the public and certainly to legislators. You know, 57,904 Kentuckians left poverty in 2018. And so with that comes a lot of things. When you're out of poverty, you have individually and, and for your family, you have better opportunities to feed yourself. You have more opportunities to eat better, to be more, to, to make other healthy decisions, which are good for the, for the, for the unit, for the individual, and for the family. But it's also obviously good for the, for the collective, for the, for the community, because we have more opportunities to, to invest in more companies to bring them here. But more importantly, to invest, invest in our education, to invest in our healthcare, which then circles back and helps the individual in the, in the, in the and the smaller unit. So economic development is where, it, where it's all about. In Kentucky, we're poor. And with poverty comes, uh, comes um, bad health outcomes. And the, but the way out of our doldrums is long-term. I, I wish we could get out of it in a, in a year or two or 10 years, but we can't. We're not gonna be able to. We can't tax our way out of it. And we can't um, cut our way out of it. And the Lord knows we can't cut much more than we've already cut. 
Uh, and I don't think we can tax much more than we've already taxed. So we're going to have to figure out um, that sweet spot. And there's a tension here, but we have to figure out the sweet spot that gives us long-term economic growth because that's going to resolve that's going to resolve our issues. Again, we're not going to tax and we're not going to cut our way out of those problems. So that's you know that that's that's effectively it. But we can do some policies that will have significant impact on um, on on our families and our individuals. Uh, you brought up one with parental leave. I know Josie Raymond's been working on that um, for a long time, and I was asked by the advocates to come on board a few months ago, and it's something that that we're going to be fighting for. I think um, having birthing centers in Kentucky, we have those in most states in the country. We don't have them in Kentucky. Bringing birthing centers into into Kentucky, I think, will help. Uh, young mothers with more options, especially looking at in the COVID situation that we're in. There's a lot of things that we can do. There's some things that we've done that we need to build on even more. Um, you said you want this to be the best place in the country for young people to live, no doubt about that. One of the things that we've done in the General Assembly is we've really had a hyper focus on foster care um, and foster families and foster children uh, for the last four years. We've done a number of things on in, in that area and we need to, we need to do it an, even more. And that I wish it weren't needed, but it's needed now more than ever with more kids being raised by kinfolk, by grandparents and from and by just regular foster families. So um, we, we've done a, we've done a great deal in that area and we need to we need to do more. Let me circle back to the beginning of the answer and to say this. I think it it all comes back to making sure that our environment in Kentucky is good for economic development. And it's not because I want the Wall Street guy to make a ton of money. Fine. I want him to. I want to make as much as he can make. Great. It's because that investment comes back into our roads, that investment comes back into our healthcare, most importantly, that investment comes back into our educational system to improve our, our standard of living in Kentucky. We, we, when we're talking uh, economic well-being and when we're talking uh, revenue and state budgets, as you mentioned, uh, I can't talk to you and not uh, invite you to weigh in on the issue of expanded gaming, specifically, right. I know sports betting. Uh, I want you to talk a little bit because that's certainly a, a signature piece of who you are. And, and I'm one who thinks that those revenue issues really do affect kids and families. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And so we have, I have, I'll, let me start with this. I have a friend who's on the, on the, what we would call fiscal court in South, in the South Indiana. And he was telling me, we, we have more money than we know what to do with. We pave our roads and sometimes we pave them again where they don't need paving. The point is they have a, the point is they have a lot of money. And whose dollars are those? They're our dollars. They're our, our citizens going over there and, and, and gaming for the most part. I'm not somebody who games. I don't, I don't gamble. I don't go to the casinos. But I am, for, I am for expanded gaming for two reasons. One, it shouldn't be illegal for me to put $10 on the Red Sox if I want to. But more importantly, to your point, it does bring in those necessary revenues. And if we thought, if the question were, do we want to bring gambling to Kentucky and it didn't exist and it wasn't around us, then we can have a philosophical moral debate. And I'm on one side and maybe somebody else is on the other side and we can have an honorable debate, good faith debate. That's not our debate today, or it shouldn't be because we're not saying, do we want to bring gambling to Kentucky? It is already here in droves. The question is whether or not we want to, we want to benefit and regulate off of, off of the gambling that's already here. And I think that's an unquestionable. Yes. I don't, I don't only really want, um, I don't only really support um, the sports betting. We also need to make sure, that we put back on shore financial or fiscal and legal footing the historical racing that the Kentucky Supreme Court declared um, unlawful last week because it wasn't done, a pro, done, done the right way. We need to, the legislature meet, needs to step up and, and fix that. Not only for, um, the, in, for the, um, the industry of, of horse racing, but also for the economy that we have in Kentucky. We're not in a position where we can just turn our back on tens of millions of dollars that we were already getting one thing to say, let's not do this, and we don't need the tens of million dollars in sports betting that it will bring in the future. But historical uh, horse racing, we're already getting those tens of millions of dollars. And because of the Supreme Court's opinion, if we don't act, we'll be losing the money that, we, that we've already um, budgeted for and, and appropriated. And so um, I support expanded gaming um, for those reasons. Obviously, as part of any bill, uh, I would be foolish if I didn't say that there are going to be uh, addicts in, in gambling. It's going to have some real losers and not just, you know, losers of the particular bet. And so for anything, any uh, measure that we move forward, we need to have, uh, we need to identify those who are problem gamers and to help them. The good thing is, Terry, when you regulate, when you make it legal, because most of it is done electronically, 
those people are much easier to find than they were in the past. So when you regulate it, actually it brings more safety to the equation. And so I, I strongly support um, expanded gaming, both for freedom purposes and for revenue purposes. You know, uh, Representative, I am so old that I remember a day when the most common ground policy arena in Frankfurt was public education. You, you could not tell the difference in a Republican and a Democrat, uh, a rural legislator and an urban legislator. And yet now, I, I'm not sure if there is a more uh, bifurcated, yeah. more polarized arena than public education. Uh, you know, again, uh, I spent some three decades as a public school educator, uh, as did my mom, my dad, and my wife. So we bring a lot of perspective on that. Uh, and uh, yet I hear really thoughtful folks uh, from who, who can look at an issue and they're so far apart. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk in a, in a big way, or you can get as specific as you want. Uh, when you think about uh, the issues we face in public education, uh, I'm not necessarily looking for a list of 17 items, though you probably could do it, but what are the one or two items that are on the front of your brain that if, if we're going to move this state ahead for all kids when it comes to learning, what are a, a couple essentials that uh, we need action from Frankfurt around? There are some things that are, are bipartisan in the education world. We've done a lot on dual credits, for example, which, which help, uh, mo mo help everybody, but mostly our kids in poverty. We've done a number of things in a bipartisan way in the education world. School safety bill, I think that was Senate Bill 1 a couple yes, of years ago, absolutely. is one. But it is, it, it's, it's, it's divisive, and I don't, I don't understand that. That's one of the things I'm trying to lead on. Um, for example, I'm the only Republican who is um, endorsed by the teachers, and, uh, and that, that's something that's really important to me. I don't think anybody agrees with any group all the time, or no group agrees with any individual legislator all the time. But it's about trying to work together when you can, and when you can't, it's about looking at somebody with kindness, with grace, and with respect. And uh, I don't know that this isn't a Kentucky thing. I think it's a, a society thing, and it's certainly at the national level as well. I brought it up earlier. I think we're just mean to one another, and I'm trying to uh, combat that. But getting back to the education issue, um, what we have to do is we have to find uh, ways to increase per pupil funding. And we put more money than we ever had in, in our seat funding in 2018, but that's a little bit of a misnomer because that's not taking um, inflation into account. When you take inflation into account, we're just back to where we were in 2008 before the big drop in our economy. But again, the way to do that, um, Terry, we talked about this at the beginning, the way to do that is we have to have economic growth in Kentucky. Um, our sister states of North Carolina and Tennessee have, you know, they were with us 50 years ago. Now they're, they're leaps and bounds in front of us. And the reason is for whatever, however, they, um, they were better at economic development than Kentucky was. And so, you know, I believe in our area. I know we're going through some difficult times right now, especially in our hometown of Louisville, but I believe in our city. We've, we have a strong city. We've got it. We are a great people here and we just need better leadership. And, you know, our public schools, Jefferson County Public Schools has 97,000 kids in it, 97,000 kids in it. It, there's not a close, it's the most important thing in government and there's not a close second. And so we're, we have to get, we have to do better with, um, with, you know, Marty Polio, uh, with uh, Brent McKim as the head of the teachers union and with uh, legislators and our governor, Andy Bashir. we've got to do better on coming uh, to, get to, the, to the table together and, and finding ways that we're going to increase funding. One more thing, if I could say in particular, and this is something that, again, it's going to be hard because so many of these things uh, uh, require money. I think we need to move toward nurses in, in each of our schools, maybe not in every school, maybe they don't, maybe, maybe it's a nurse per three or four, whatever, whatever the, whatever the, the people, um, you know, the superintendents think is, is appropriate, but we have to move toward nurses in our schools, especially our high impoverished areas. That will not only help the health of the kids, obviously that's the point, but it will help their education. Um, and so that's, it, it costs a lot of money. It's, these things are very difficult to do, especially when the, when the pot of money is not full, but um, I, th I think we need to move toward nurses in our, in our school system. I think that would, that would have uh, pay, pay huge dividends. Yeah, you know, we always talk about it's hard to think about multiplication tables when you have a abscessed ear or a, or a toothache. Well, you're hungry. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Representative, one of the issues that, that I really am uh, trying to figure out and, and kind of haunts me, uh, if you look at 
the numbers that you referenced, our, our kids count data, and you look underneath those numbers, the disparity between kids of color and white kids right. is profound and uh, should uh, uh, embarrass us all. Uh, the two areas we just talked about, uh, the percentage of children who live in poverty, dramatic differences between African-American kids and Hispanic kids and white kids, issues of uh, fourth grade reading proficiency or eighth grade reading uh, math attainment. If you look at other sectors, whether that's juvenile justice or health or child welfare, you see those same disparities. Before I ask you some pragmatic, uh, what could we do? I I'm curious, uh, what's the appetite in Frankfurt? Uh, for a long time, it was tough to talk to uh, legislators in Frankfurt about issues of, of racial equity. Uh, you think that's changed or it's still a problem? What, what do you see the landscape in Frankfurt looking at when it comes to racial justice in 2021 session? Well, when I talk to my colleagues in the House that are from areas with not many minorities, um, you know, it's, it's not maybe the first thing on the radar because they don't have many minorities in a lot of areas of, of Kentucky. But I think, um, I think everybody sees Louisville as their city. And, uh, and I think that's true. We, we've got to do better respecting those outside of Louisville and they're doing, they have to do better respecting Louisville and understanding that we are in this bad boy together. I mean, if we don't succeed, if our kids don't succeed, then their kids don't succeed. So we, I think we're in it together and I think people are realizing that more. So I, there, there's, and to a person, Terry, and I'm going to answer the question, but to a person, everybody I talk to, Republican and Democrat in the, in the House and in the Senate, they get into this thing because they actually care about their community. I know we like to, we like to take pot shots at politicians and, hey, that's fair, we signed up for it. But these are people who actually do care. And um, when they see a problem, they try to address it. Juvenile justice is a perfect example. We had Representative Tilly when the Democrats controlled the House and Senator Westerfield um, both come together. They're from Hopkinsville, Hopkinsville area. Both come together and make tremendous strides on juvenile justice. Um, just last year, they were, we were going to shut down because the city of Louisville decided that they didn't want to have the juvenile justice facility right anymore in Louisville, and they were going to ship our kids out. These are our kids. I don't care if they're West End kids, South End kids, East End kids. They're our kids, and they're also the kids, you know, other representatives of Kentucky. They are going to ship our kids out to Adair County. And now, I love Adair County, but that's a two-and-a-half-hour drive. What, what, what can you not do if your kids are two-and-a-half hours away? You can't see them. Mm -hmm. You don't have an opportunity for them to be closer to their, to their schools and to their loved ones and to their community. So we fought, and we got uh, Governor Bevan, and now, and now Governor Bashir has committed – to putting those kids, keeping those kids in, in Eastern Jefferson County, in Jefferson County. Thank you. I'm happy that it's in my district off of, off of 146. Right. So that's one thing that we're doing to, to make sure it doesn't get worse. But we're also doing things I think are, are bad. You know, we, we passed the so-called gang bill a couple years ago. And Terry, I, the, the thing that I'm the most proud of that I've done in the four years that I've been there was actually a loss. I think, I think we've had a lot of victories, but, but I lost the, the, the vote on the gang bill, I fought with everything I had against it. It was a so-called gang bill. It was not really, it was really addressed at the, at the, the kid on the street to try to get them to turn the guy up top. And, and what it did was it, it threw so many young people's lives away because if they get convicted of petty crimes, they get double enhanced and then they have to serve, I think it was 75 or 85% of the sentence before they were eligible for parole. So we're, in a lot of ways, we're going the wrong way. Um, and so we need to, we need to stop those things, and I, 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 I'm lamenting that right now. But we also have some things that we're doing well. Um, we, we need to understand, as we said earlier, that economic opportunity should come for everybody and not just, you know, rich white people in rural areas or in the suburbs. It has to, we have to look at truth and look at, look at um, things that are uncomfortable right in the eye and understand that we have to do better for our, our families in, uh, in areas with more minority people like the South End and the West End. They, they have to be brought into um, the, the zone of opportunity, if you will, and we've not done that well enough. Um, and that's on all of us, and that's a shame on us, and we've got to do better. And I think the situation we're going through understand, brings it to an understanding that we must do better. At the same time, the community is, is part of that, and we have to, have, um, we have to encourage with our policies uh, and, and reward good decision-making. When people, when people graduate, that means something. When they, when they do right by whatever the, the thing in front of them is, when they, when they work, um, those things have good benefits that we, 
um, that, that when people make good decisions, no matter who they are, or where they are, it actually pays off for them. So that, that's kind of rambling a little bit, but I do think that this is an issue that is at the front. And as I'm talking to my colleagues in the house, um, everybody has a heart to make sure that we improve, um, improve the, the situation. That's actually encouraging. So let's assume, uh, as I, I know you hope we do, that on November 3rd, you're reelected and uh, that final gavel has now fallen in 2021 session. Uh, a weird session, short session, uh, one year budget adopted, uh, really getting ready to set up for a two year. Uh, when Jason Nemus leaves the Capitol for the final moments of this 2021 session, uh, what legacy do you hope that session brings? Is, are there a couple targeted bills or an overall gestalt that you hope when you look back on the session, you can say, if we did this, yeah. then uh, that was time well spent? I think with the um, revenue projections that we, that we see, we have to be realistic. And I think this is a hold serve year. Um, we're going to have our revenues are going to go down. Thankfully, we have had a lot of federal funding come in. And in a weird way, some of our revenue, this is short term, but our revenue from last year has increased. And that's because we tax unemployment benefits and we've had that $600 kicker from federal government. That's going away. It's, it's at least lessening now. It will go away in the future. And the businesses, we've had 300 in Jefferson County. The businesses that have shut down will have a lasting impact. So we have to try to get back to where we were. So I, I think if we can just hold serve with the budget this year, that will be a tremendously uh, beneficial beneficial result. But let me let me talk about one policy. This may not have a direct impact on the on, on KYA, but there's something that means so much to me, and that is that that I really want to get medical marijuana passed this year. And I'm somebody who I put my hand on a stack of Bibles. I've never used an illegal drug in my life, and when I ran, I was against medical marijuana and marijuana. But I've looked men and women, I've looked fathers and, and mothers in the eye, and I know what medical marijuana can bring to some people. And so them making decisions with their, with their position, um, our government needs to allow people to try to, uh, to be and feel better. And so I want to pass medical marijuana this session. It's something that, that won't cost money, so it's a, it's a success that we can have, and it's a success that we ought to have just to put, to put on the board, yes, but it will bring tremendous benefits to countless Kentuckians and we need to pass medical marijuana. I know that's not directly a KYA agenda item, but it's, it's very important to me. Representative, uh, those 30 minutes went by really quickly. Uh, wow. I, I need to say that, uh, I need to say that uh, we at KYA, uh, and I would say this very publicly, uh, appreciate the fact that you always do give us access uh, and you listen well to us. Uh, we appreciate you taking time uh, in the middle of a campaign, in the middle of COVID, in the middle of your work day to spend uh, 30 minutes with uh, your constituents as well as uh, KYA's partners. Uh, we appreciate it and uh, we hope you have a good rest of the day. A again, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Terry. Let me say to your members real quickly, the, the KYA is well represented by yourself and by Ben Geese, who we see all the time in Frankfurt. Um, not everybody up there trusts everyone, but we all trust the two of you. And so that's to, that, that is very good. That's Republican and Democrat alike. So thank you for having me today and thank you for the work that you do for our kids. Thanks a lot. Jesse, I believe you're next up on the docket. Thanks, Representative Nemes. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Representative Nemes. Hi, everyone. I am Jesse Wittish with Kentucky Youth Advocates. And uh, I am so excited to be part of this candidate forum today because I am a constituent of House District 33 and the mom of a kid who will be starting public school next year. So I'm really excited to be hearing from both candidates today. Um, these candidates are one example of electoral advocacy, and I don't know if folks joining the uh, forum today know that you are participating in electoral advocacy, but what that is, um, it's in uh, edu candidates educating voters about themselves and the issues they care about, and from our point of view, even more importantly, Advocate, advocates educating and asking questions of candidates. So the bad news is that we here at Kentucky Youth Advocates cannot host a forum in every single House district, in every single Senate district where somebody's up for election, um, in every local race, every federal race, but you as advocates can all talk to your candidates, whether that's local, state, or federal candidates. So 
To help you get those conversations started, Kentucky Youth Advocates has developed an electoral advocacy toolkit. And I'm going to just really briefly share my screen and show you this toolkit. Uh, some of you may have seen this before. We've shared this in some of our advocate virtual forums. Um, but just to, just as a reminder here, so let me, we are going to, I think you can see all of my screen now. Oh, sorry, everyone. There we go. Okay, sorry for my technical difficulties here. All right. Here we go. Okay, so here is our electoral advocacy toolkit. And what this is meant to do is for you as advocates to learn a little bit more about kids in your area. Um, you all are the voices for kids. So here's some information about data that you can um, check out and a little bit of information about policy. And this is also something you can use to educate your candidates. So provide them with data, provide them with um, some information about these policies. Um, and then we have five conversation starters. These are questions for candidates, big picture questions, different than what Terry asked today and what he's going to be asking again later. Um, but big picture questions about priorities related to kids and families. Um, what's going on with kids in our district? What do you care about <clears throat> with regards to kids that live here? And this is where referring to that data, um, that county level data from the Kids Count Data Center can be really helpful. Um, how do your policies serve the needs of every Kentucky kid? So this is, um, you heard Representative Nemus talk about it. Uh, as Terry asked about, he's going to ask the same question um, of candidate Platner around, um, you know, we can't talk about Kentucky without talking about race equity, without what it means to live in different districts, without um, talking about what it means to, um, for really disparate incomes within homes. So how are you thinking about all those kids, whether or not they live in your district? Um, what have you done for kids lately? So Representative Nemus talked a lot about what he has done in the General Assembly. Um, if you are speaking to a candidate who hasn't served in public office, you can see if they've, um, you know, what do they do in their personal or professional lives when it comes to committing to kids and families? Um, or what are the, um, you know, kind of what do they bring to the table when it comes to experience? Uh, for kids and families. And then finally, just a thank you to candidates for putting kids first. Obviously, elections can be kind of contentious and can be kind of, dare we say it, even toxic. And a thank you can go such a long way um, to uh, thank your candidates or your ele elected officials to build those relationships and thank them for making good decisions on behalf of kids and families or for prioritizing kids and families in their campaigns. And uh, the idea that if uh, more, if we thank more of those leaders for putting kids first, hopefully other candidates, other elected officials see that and they start to pay attention and do uh, do the same thing. So that's our toolkit. I'm going to drop a link to that in the chat so you can reference that later. Um, and then I will stop sharing this because we expect candidate Platner to be joining us here within the next couple of minutes. I think we're here. Yeah, right on time. Good afternoon. Um, is 
like you're still muted. I'm gonna I'm gonna unmute you real quick. There we go. There we go. Candidate well, Flatter, we want to welcome you to our forum with Kentucky Youth Advocates. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much. Sure. Uh, I'll be brief in my introduction so we can okay. get straight to our Q&A with Dr. Terry Brooks, the Executive Director of Kentucky Youth Advocates. Okay. Again, want to say thank you to all of the citizens of House District 33 in Jefferson and Oldham Counties who are here being civically engaged with us this afternoon. Uh, we just welcomed and heard a bit from Representative Nemus, and so now we are very excited to hear about your vision for making Kentucky the best place in America to be a kid. Uh, so with that, I'll toss things to Dr. Brooks. Okay, thanks, Ben. Margaret, we really appreciate you taking time to join us uh, in the middle of a busy schedule, and we look forward to a uh, informal, conversational sure. 30 minutes together. So we sure. appreciate you being here. Uh, you, you know, uh, you cannot look at your biography and kind of be very impressed. Uh, you know, logistics and intelligence officer for the, the Navy. Uh, you served our nation both domestically and I believe overseas in Japan. Uh, you came back to Kentucky and gave uh, 20 years of service in what looks to be uh, a pretty diverse arena from veterans affairs to transportation to teen tobacco compliance director, right? Is that, that there do you I have go. that? I wanted to talk about that today. Do I have that right? So I, I guess I'm, I'm, guess I'm curious as to, given the world in which we live, what in the world are you thinking? Uh, <laughs> why, why is it and what was the motivation that got you to decide to run for public office? You know, so Terry, we're going to have a casual conversation here. And, you know, I've had some moments. I'm like, wow, you know, this is running for public office is a big deal. And uh, you really have to stick your neck out. And uh, so, you know, that could be challenging at times. But I just felt like, quite honestly, I, I didn't care for the direction of our country. I thought we could do better in the Commonwealth. And I wanted to step up and you know, see what I could have to offer and continue public service in a different way. I've been around government and politics for a long time. And I'm certainly not an expert, but at the same time, I feel like I have that experience that I believe well qualifies me to run for public office. Okay. I was, I was caught by a phrase that, uh, that was included in your letter to voters. And I think you ended that by saying that you made a commitment to be a public servant first and a politician second. Uh, we know that the environment in Frankfurt, as in Washington, mm -hmm. is polarized, bifurcated, and pretty darn toxic. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As, you, as you think about going to Frankfurt, uh, mm -hmm. if, if, you know, if you're elected on November 3rd, you're gonna mm -hmm. be showing up at a unusual session, short session, unprecedented, one year budget in a short session, aftermath of a presidential election. Uh, from where you sit, whether as a, a citizen today, or I'm sure you're not without uh, analysis from your time in the military and your time in Frankfurt, uh, what can a freshman legislator do to bring that attitude of public service first and politics second to, to Frankfurt? Good question. Um, you know, I really think it's important to listen. Listen to different points of view. Um, see what people have to say. Sit down and have those conversations. Um, I've been doing that throughout my public life, um, particularly working in Frankfurt. I worked as a legislative liaison for two different agencies. So I know it's important to listen. And then from there, you know, make decisions about how to move forward. So I think collegiality is important. Civility is important. Um, conducting oneself, um, you know, I think appropriately and respectfully is a way to start. Um, and we have to start somewhere. So why not start in that direction? Okay, thank you. Uh, as Ben mentioned, uh, we at KYA uh, offer what we think is a, a simple but profound vision that we want Kentucky to be the best place in America to be mm -hmm. young. Mm -hmm. uh, we also are just flat out not smart enough to figure out 
how kids grow up in silos. I, I know you have a daughter and my yeah. hypothesis would be that family economics impacted her health and health impacted her education and education impacted her future and it goes down the line. So we want to, during the, the course of this conversation, we want to give you plenty of time to talk about plenty of items. But uh, I generally begin with the hypothesis that that the cornerstone of a kid's well-being has a lot to do with family economics and family well-being. Uh, the idea that we have a quarter of a million little boys and little girls in Kentucky who live in poverty in 2020 uh, is, is a, a data point that is difficult for me to let go. Sure. So I'm, I'm wondering if you would like, a, a lot of your uh, uh, campaign platform has to do with the economy, economic development, also family, economic structure, taxes. It's, so I, I want to give you a, a, a little bit of an open question and let you riff a little bit when you think about okay. economics and economic well-being for the mm -hmm. Commonwealth and mm -hmm. for families. Mm -hmm. uh, what would we get from a, a representative platner? Well, um, I guess it's a broad question, and I think that economic development is important because it produces jobs. Um, jobs produce income that's brought back to the family, and, um, and that's uh, how a family sustains itself, at least, you know, from a bread and butter standpoint. So that's why I think that's important. Um, I certainly think there's a lot of other things that are important uh, in relation to family. I think emotional well-being. Um, I think quality of life with your uh, surrounding circumstances, a clean environment. Um, I think there's a, a, a lot of factors that go together for quality of life for a family. And when a family is intact, um, that's, I believe, better for children. And I think that that gives children a, a healthier springboard from which to launch their lives. I don't think that's the only way to go, but I think just having love and support at the end of the day is what a child needs. And through policy, um, supporting mental health, economic development, quality schools, health care, all of those lead to um, a quality of life for a child. Okay, thanks. Uh, I am uh, old enough to remember when the most common ground issue in Frankfurt was K-12 education. Uh, you could not tell the difference in a Republican and a Democrat, uh, a rural legislator and an urban legislator. Uh, I, I don't think there's a policy arena that has shifted more dramatically than public education because uh, in our world, it may be the most divisive issue out there. Uh, when you look at your uh, campaign materials, uh, you spend a lot of time talking about uh, schools and funding and other issues related to public education. So again, uh, because I, I do want this to be conversational, not just back and forth, uh, take a few minutes and paint the vision, the hopes and the priorities that you have when you think about Kentucky's public schools. Well, I think, our public school system is a reflection of our community. And, um, and we're investing in kids that is the future. And yes, it also means um, it's a ticket for opportunity. And I believe a good public educational school system helps to attract businesses to Kentucky. Um, so I believe we have to be making sure that uh, kids have a quality school to go to, a, a, a building that's in good shape, um, paying our teachers well, so we have good people that are working with our kids, uh, mental health support. So um, I just think that public education is everything. And if we don't invest, then we're shortchanging our kids and we're shortchanging our future. So I believe to the fullest capacity that we can to, to fund a K through 12 public education, we should endeavor to do that. And you, you mentioned uh, in both of your answers uh, that you can't talk about policy without talking about revenue and budget and taxes. And those are tough issues. They are. Uh, What's your sense? Uh, what's your philosophy? How would you approach the issue of revenue, 
Uh, do we need increases? We got to keep cutting. There's a balance. Uh, what's the big picture from your perspective uh, when it comes to, uh, because again, uh, certainly not original with us, but uh, we perceive a state budget as really not just dollars and cents, but priorities and principles. So how, how do we build uh, an adequate, sustainable state budget, knowing the pressures that we as a commonwealth face? Yeah, um, again, good questions, Terry. So my viewpoint is this, government is cut to the bone um, in state government. And um, sure, there's always some efficiency somewhere, but I think by and large, we can't keep cutting our way to prosperity. I think we have to invest in order to grow a prosperity. So how do I envision doing that? Number one, I think we need to change the tax code structure uh, and make it more fair. Um, so I believe that we need to have fair taxation. Uh, the flat tax, I think, gives a break for people at the top and punishes people more so who are middle to lower income. So restructuring the tax code, I think, would be more fair. And um, I think that's one way to perhaps generate more revenue, not only individual, but also businesses as well. Businesses pay a little bit more, uh, the more prosperous you are as a business. Um, so that's number one, restructuring the tax code. I also think we need to be uh, coming up with new ideas and generating new revenue. So uh, I know this is conversation that's been out there, but I think we need to be legalizing sports betting. I think we need to be legalizing um, gaming uh, here in Kentucky. Um, so, you know, why are we losing money to Indiana? I mean, they, I think their holdings this year, they took in about a billion dollars. Granted, only a slice of that was used to generate revenue back to the state budget, but that shows you that that is um, a very uh, potentially lucrative area. And um, I think we have to be careful about our uh, business tax giveaways to attracting businesses. We need to be attracting high quality jobs. Um, if we're attracting low wage jobs, just to say that we're attracting businesses, I don't think that's very strategic. So that's where education becomes important, again, because the more quality your educational school systems is, I think that that will help attract uh, higher quality jobs to come to Kentucky. And it's just the right thing to do. So tax code change, um, revenue additions, those are some things that I see that we need to be doing. Um, and I'm sure there's other ideas out there as well that I'm open to listening to. Thank you. Uh, KYA is, uh majors in data. We really believe that, I like uh, that. I like what that. gets measured gets changed. And yeah. so whether we're talking about economic well-being or education, which we, we've talked about, or health or safety or juvenile justice, numbers tell us that growing up in Kentucky as a white kid is a very different experience, a very different reality than growing up as an African-American kid. Uh, yeah. The disparities yeah. uh, should alarm us all. Uh, they should challenge us all. Uh, my question is both uh, strategic and policy oriented. So that's a, that's a tough issue to get traction in Frankfurt. Uh, you can speculate on multiple reasons. Yeah. Uh, if we're really gonna close the disparity gap it's going to require legislators, and I would suggest especially legislators from Louisville, to be creative and thoughtful in how they approach it. So talk a bit from where you're coming, uh, knowing not just the current circumstances in Louisville, as, as important as those are to address, yeah. Yeah. but we're talking about endemic disparities. Right. Uh, how do we begin to bridge that gap? How do we begin to lift up all kids in Kentucky? Uh, what role do you see yourself and frankly, the Jefferson County delegation playing? Yes. So I'm going to say, I'm going to start off a little bit more broadly and then sure. narrow it down to Kentucky. Uh, um, first of all, we need to work for a more just society period. Um, for those communities that struggle, uh, particularly, uh, in uh, our urban areas, um, you know, it's just long overdue that we need to tackle this structural inequities in a big way uh, and not nibble around the edges. So my hope is this, Joe Biden gets elected president. 
that we get a Democratic U.S. Senate and keep the House. Therefore, I believe the Democrats will do a better job of investing in changing some of these structural inequities. And that means more funding for education. It means comprehensive health care for all. And so um, when I mean education, I mean uh, the Democrats want to up to $125,000 family income through Pell Grant loans offer a free college education. We should be giving people who are low income up to a certain level middle income and opportunity to go to college if they want to do so and money shouldn't be a barrier. Also what I would say the same for the vocational track system. The goalposts have moved. If we want a better educated society we're going to have to invest in that. We need to make sure people have health care. So bringing this back to me if I'm elected as a legislator I would like to work with John Yarmouth then is um, and he is working obviously at the federal level and we can help bring back more investment from the federal government into Kentucky and I believe Andy Bashir is someone that we could work with as well and would be supportive of that I don't think Kentucky has the money to invest in a community college education for free and I don't I'm suspect about providing affordable health care for all at the state level. The dollars are going to have to come from the federal government. That's what I'm trying to say to you. So there needs to be a partnership between federal and state in these initiatives to really help lift Kentucky. That's how I see it. We are not a wealthy state. We need to be developing partnerships to help us rank higher when it comes to education and health, for example. Okay, thank you. I'm going to give you a chance to talk big picture priority in a minute, but I can't okay. not ask. That's a double negative on purpose. Okay. I referenced it. So what the heck was the teen tobacco compliance project? You, I, okay. I'm not going to let you off the you hook should. and not talk about that. So, so what I'm is that about? I'm glad you brought it up. Well, um, as you know, I served 22 years in Kentucky state government and I worked on, under a variety of, um, different projects that I feel very fortunate to have been uh, given the opportunity to work with. All right. So I don't know, Terry, if you remember or not, but tobacco was a big deal in selling to kids in the 1990s. Absolutely. And um, the federal government, the FDA, required the states to prohibit the sale of tobacco products to minors under 18. Every state had to put in a program or you risk losing state funding for mental health initiatives from the federal government. So basically it was forced, but Paul Patton, who was governor at the time, wanted to move forward with this initiative. So the first person didn't work out. He asked me to do it. And I said, okay. So um, the bottom line was we created a compliance team and um, we, uh, you know, worked with retailers um, about not selling tobacco products to minors. And basically what it was, was sending in uh, people to try to buy tobacco products. Like Secret shoppers for yes. cigarettes, yeah. Secret shoppers, like they do with alcohol. We yeah. uh -huh. did the same thing with tobacco, sending people in to see if they could buy a sale. Now I know some retailers didn't appreciate that, <laughs> but that was the only way we could know, are you yeah. selling legally or are you not? So, um, put forth a program, we significantly reduced the sale of tobacco products uh, to minors from uh, retailers. And um, we just basically made it harder to do. I partnered with the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. Mm -hmm. The FDA invited me to come to Washington and make a presentation because Kentucky was an example of being um, a state that was making this program work, but in a territory where tobacco was also king. Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, I, I'm very proud of that work that we did. And one more quick thing, I wrote a grant to the FDA and they gave us $250,000 to further uh, branch out with the program to make us become even more effective. Okay, good. So I'm proud of work. Yeah, that, that's great. Uh, let me ask you, uh, I, I wanna close out, I wanna be respectful of time, but, but there's sure. two questions that I wanna ask as we sure. close out. One is, as our partners and, uh, frankly, uh, residents of, uh, of the 33rd District, 
including Jesse Wittish, who's sitting there on screen with you. Oh, very good. So she can she can hold up her ballot, and she said she hasn't filled it out. So there you go. There you uh, go. Is, is uh, what what do you have a particular passion uh, around kids? Uh, some of our best. Uh, Frankfurt kid champions. Well, they, they look at kids in broad ways, but it's like, man, this is my pet project. This is my beat. I'm going to become the, you know, the, the, the main focal point for this. What, what issue is that for Margaret Plattner? Um, gosh, you know, there's so many. So, so you're going to have to ask me to choose. Um, you know, I think childcare is very important. And I wanna, I wanna make this point here. I think if you had more women in, in, in the legislature, childcare issues, early uh, childhood education, some of these problems I think would have been tackled a long time ago. I really believe that. So I think childcare is very important, uh, particularly for parents, it's usually mostly women who, um, uh, you know, and we're dealing with the pandemic here that are perhaps losing out on e employment opportunities because children are learning from the home environment virtually. So if we have good child care, I think that helps to lift people to be in the workplace um, if they choose to be so. And we wanna also make sure child care is, is done very, very well. So I think child care is a okay. passion. The, one other quick point, and this is economic, I know, but I think the earned income tax credit would be something that would be very beneficial to families and that I would like to see uh, and would like to pursue further um, in working with others to maybe do this. And you know, when, when we at KYA talk about a EITC, we remind people that that was invented by Richard Nixon, championed by Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, right. the Bushes, and Barack Obama. So That's Ronald right. Reagan and Barack Obama agree on There you on go, bipartisan, all the way around. Uh, so, uh, so uh, you become representative of yes. the 33rd district on November yes. 3rd. Yes. Uh, the, the gavel has fallen to close out the 2021 session. Uh, when you look back, uh, that legacy of your very first term, uh, what are the markers you're going to apply? What when you give yourself uh, a self-assessment, when you're grading yourself, uh, what do you have to do to get an A uh, during this first term as the representative of the 33rd district? Survive. But okay, that's, that's not a that's, good, that's not a bad that's answer. Not, that's not a good answer. That's not a good that's answer. It's actually a good answer. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, look, everything's so topsy-turvy. I mean, who knows what will arise? in the 2021 session. We've got to get a budget. Um, you know, it's a short session, so it's hard to probably get something really substantive, substantively done. I guess at the end of the day, and maybe this is a little boring, I just want to have a really good budget that provides the support where the support is needed. And there's lots of different places that need that. I'd love to say yes to funding to everything, but some tough decisions are going to have to be made. And, um, I just want to make sure at the end of the day, I'm doing everything I can to help Kentucky move forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Margaret Plattner, you are in the middle of a campaign and uh, we really appreciate it. It means a whole lot to us that you took sure. time today to, uh, to talk to us about Kentucky's kids, families, and the 33rd district. So we appreciate you being here and uh, we wish you well as the, uh, as the autumn unfolds. I believe uh, now I'm supposed to kick it to constituent Jesse Wittish uh, at KYA. Is that correct, Jesse? That is correct. Thank yes. You, do I leave or do I stay? You 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 can stay for you're the benediction. Stay. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. You're welcome to stay. Yeah. Hi. Um. Thank you so much, um, candidate Platner. Great to meet you, as Terry thank referenced. You. So I got my ballot here, and my son is going to be starting public school next year. So it was really great to hear from you and also from Representative Nemus. Thank you to the advocates who joined us for the forum today. And I'll just do a quick plug for our next candidate forum, which is coming up next Wednesday, October 5th at 5 p.m. Eastern. Kentucky Youth Advocates will be hosting the candidates from House District 32, Representative Tina Bojanowski and candidate Hunt Brownsaval. 
And whether you live in that district or you just care about kids and want to know uh, what's going on with those candidates in that district, we invite you to join us. And all the details about that forum are up on our website for you to RSVP for that if folks are interested. So again, thank you everyone for joining us, including Representative Nemus and Candidate Platner, and looking forward to more. Thanks. Bye, Thank everyone. Thank you so much.